instructional video, not a training video. It's meant to inform, not train. So be sure that you get professional help based on your level of training ability. Working with horses can be very dangerous. You want to make sure you and the horse are always safe. Right, puppy? <laughs> I see too many people who choose the option of forcing a horse to stand still to accept a scary object. Um, it's not something I would ever recommend that you do because when you force a horse to stand still by either restraining it or yanking on its lead rope or yanking on its halter or overcorrecting it to make it stand absolutely still, what you're doing is, is you're teaching the horse to internalize its tension, to internalize its anxiety. And that anxiety and tension will build up over time. A horse that is forced to stand still to accept objects rather than learn how to work with them and deal with them in a correct manner is more dangerous than a horse that threatens to rear. It's more dangerous than a horse that threatens to bite or kick out. It's more dangerous than a horse that's yahooing around and not behaving. Because those horses that are threatening to rear and kick out and bite and racing around and acting incorrectly are showing you that they can't tolerate the situation. They're showing you that they're not able for some reason to accept the situation and handle it correctly. You're getting a warning. The horse that's been forced to stand still for scary objects is not going to give you a warning. Um, I wish I could remember the person who told me this analogy because it's an excellent analogy and I would like to give them credit but I don't remember who it was. When you force a horse to stand still, it's like putting air in a balloon. The balloon looks nice, it looks nice, it looks nice, it looks nice as the air gets filled up in the balloon. But then suddenly it reaches a point where you can't put any more air in the balloon so the balloon blows up. Well, it's the same thing with a horse. You internalize the tension, internalize the tension, internalize the tension, and the horse looks good, looks good, looks good, looks good, and then BAM! It blows up. This is the kind of horse that's taught with this type of training that it'll blow up and it'll create a serious problem or a serious injury and people will say, I gee, I never would have suspected it. That horse is so well trained. Who would have figured? Yeah, who would have figured? Well, the horse just reached the point where it couldn't stuff the tension anymore and it blew up. It may take days, it may take weeks, it may take a year for the horse to reach the point where it can't stuff any more tension. It depends on the horse and the horse's tolerance level. But when it reaches that tolerance level, it's not going to show you that it's going to blow up. It's just going to blow. If you have a horse that has a problem um, facing a scary object or scary objects in general, try to empathize with the horse. Try to think of your worst fear. And everybody has them. Horses have them, people have them, everybody has them. We all have at least one. Think of your worst fear. Uh, say it's, for example, you're afraid of heights. So someone takes you to the top of the Grand Canyon and they make you tow up to the edge where there's no railing and they make you stand there to uh, face that fear, to cure you of that fear. Um, say and I, this next one is from personal experience. I almost drowned as a child, a very small child. I was two, and I didn't know about it, but I grew up afraid of water. And certain uh, adults in my life thought that it would be really cool to toss me in off docks and so forth and get me to swim, and it only scared me more. So perhaps this is why I can empathize with a horse that... Um, has a fear or a phobia or is just a little skittish of all items in general. But try to think for a moment of what your worst fear is and how you would like someone to help you approach it. Would you want them to make you stand at the edge of the cliff to uh, face uh, being scared of heights or push you out of an airplane uh, on a parachute to do it or throw you into the water to get over your fear of the water? Or would you want them to lock you in a dark room if you're afraid of the dark? Or put you in a small box because you're afraid of small spaces? Now, think of the horse 
and the fear that that horse has and the phobia that that horse has and try to empathize with them and realize that their fear can be just as real as yours is in that situation that you were just thinking about. The horse has a very real fear. It's not something they're faking. And it's something that you need to empathize with them over before you can help them fix it. Instead of forcing a horse to stand still, however that may be, whether you're uh, yanking its lead rope or its halter, or you're hobbling it, or you're sedating it, instead of doing any number of things that you can do to force the horse to stand still, you should be allowing it to move. A horse's natural reaction to something that it's afraid of is to flee. And if you take away that option, there is no submission. A horse in a scary situation does a couple of things. It flees, or it stands and fights, or it gives up. There is no submission. So if you're forcing a horse to stand still with the thought that it's eventually going to submit to you and the scary object, think again. You're not creating submission. You're creating a horse that's giving up. And that's not something you want to do either. I find the people who over control a horse or the ones that want a horse to stand absolutely still are the people who are afraid of horses and that includes trainers and professionals that work with horses they can also be afraid of horses and I would suggest that if you hear someone who's going to work with your horse say that the horse should stand absolutely still red flags should go up and you should question the situation because people who tend to want a horse to stand absolutely still and to do exactly what they want all the time are people that need the horse to be that way because they don't understand the unpredictability of the horse and they do not trust the horse and those are a recipe for disaster I can give you an example of one where a young vet came here to uh, attempt to vaccinate my horse. My horse has a phobia of shots and uh, the vet visit. I'm not quite sure if it's the actual vet or if it's the shots, but when uh, my horse hears the diesel truck start to come up the driveway, he'll start doing laps around this paddock and he'll actually throw himself into the fence. That's how agitated he gets over knowing the vet is coming. And I actually had him do it one time when a town truck pulled in the bottom of the driveway. I was like, whoa, the vet's not due here. What's going on? I went and looked, and sure enough, it was a diesel truck similar to his truck in the bottom of the driveway. And I had to calm my horse down. So anyway, on this day that this young, new, and experienced vet was going to show up and try to give my horse a shot, I was playing with him in the paddock so that he wouldn't hear the diesel truck or be concentrating on the truck, and he didn't hear it. And when I heard the door shut on the truck and gave a couple seconds for her to get moving or whatever, I started to walk over to the fence and she came around the corner and started across the backyard. She was walking with somebody and she kind of had her head down, wasn't paying attention to where she was going. When she got halfway across the yard, she was up to a riding lawnmower that was parked there and kind of put her head up and she saw my horse and she said, Oh my God, he's huge. And she actually physically stopped and took a couple steps back when she said that. Now, my horse is not a small horse, but I would no, by no means say he's huge. He's only 15'3". And I don't think that it was his actual size that scared her. I think it was his enthusiasm. He had a look on his face that in the instance before she looked up, I looked at him and thought, wow, he's going to do this today. He's confident. He knows what he's doing. He, if this fence wasn't here, he'd walk right up to her. This is a person who told me that he would have to stand absolutely still before she would go anywhere near him. And she went within like maybe five, six feet. Well, I don't even think it was that close. She reached out to the fence and touched his nose while he stretched his nose out and that's as close as she ever got to him during that visit which it would all be kind of funny but I had to pay for the visit so that took away a little of the humor but I, I do chuckle when I I think about her getting part way through the lawn and looking up and going oh my god he's huge and taking those two steps back <laughs> but this I gave this example not to make fun of her you know she's obviously afraid of either large horses or over enthusiastic horses one or the other but um, and I by no means want to make fun of her fear but 
I'm trying to give an example to point out that when you see a person who requests that a horse stand absolutely still, they're requesting that for a very specific reason. They're usually afraid of horses. I want to mention something that occurred during this interaction that I just described because it's something that you might be able to watch for in a situation with your own horse if your horse is, has a, a phobic uh, situation like this. When that vet looked up, saw my horse, stopped, took the two or three steps back and said, oh my God, he's huge. My horse, who had his head out over the fence and was looking very eager to run up to her, withdrew his head back behind the fence and came over behind me and put his head out over my shoulder looking for reassurance. I think the horse had no idea that she was afraid of him at that point. He saw her fear and he reacted to her fear and came behind me for protection. Kind of like thinking, oh my god, that lady is afraid of something. Help protect me. Save me from whatever it is she's afraid of. You want to realize that horses mirror people and they don't always mirror the person who's actually working with the horse not it's not always the person who's in charge that they're mirroring in this situation he saw she was afraid of something he was like oh my god what the hell is she afraid of uh, protect me save me from it and it, it was kind of interesting because after that point where he pulled his head back in and came and hid behind me and so forth, it was very tough to pick out which one of them was more afraid of the other. Uh, he was just as hesitant of her as they, she reached out and pet his nose and so forth. He was kind of reaching out the same way she was. She was very hesitantly reaching out to pet his nose and he was kind of like doing the same thing like and they were mirroring each other and they were actually feeding off of each other they were making each other more afraid of the other rather than calming each other down the horse hadn't done anything at this point to show that he was going to misbehave or that he was going to attempt to harm her in any way and he wasn't misbehaving his ears were very alert his head was up high his eyes were bright and he was leaning forward and looking and that, I think, is what scared her. It was the enthusiasm that he was showing. And more than that, he wasn't in absolute control. Uh, when somebody wants a horse to be in absolute control and uh, stand absolutely still, they're meaning four feet planted into one spot in the ground, and they do not move those feet. And the head is down, and the horse is submissive and it's waiting for you to tell it what to do. There is a fine line when you're doing this with a horse between a horse being submissive and a horse being shut down. If you have a horse that stands with all four feet plugged into the ground, its head's down, and it's just waiting for you to tell it what to do next or waiting for you to do whatever you want to do, and it doesn't turn and look to see what you're doing, and it shows no interest whatsoever, it's just standing there, that horse is shut down and that is not something you want to teach a horse to do either. Uh, you want a horse to be standing still and cooperating with you but you want them to be showing an amount of interest because if they're not whatever amount of interest they're not showing in what you're doing will gauge the level that that horse is shut down. We honor and look up to people who are brave, confident, self-assured, uh, eager, uh, those that get the job done, those that are willing to uh, step up to a challenge. But when it comes to horses, we train that out of a horse. Um, many times you'll see people that um, like to work with the horse that stands with all four feet plugged into the ground and it's head down it's just standing there waiting for you to tell it what to do. And I've had people brag to me and tell me how well behaved their horse is because it will do that. And I want to put a big caution out there. If you have a horse that stands there with all four feet plugged into the ground and just stands there waiting for you to do something with it, whether it be take its temperature, work with its feet, uh, give it a shot, whatever you're doing with it, if it stands there and does that and it doesn't look to see what you're doing, 
that horse is shut down or in the process of shutting down. It's not that the horse is well behaved, the horse is not behaving at all. Um, when I introduce a horse to uh, new and scary objects, I do a few different things. One of them is I do food reward training. Uh, giving food during training sessions has a purpose other than that you're trying to uh, over pamper the horse or you're trying to treat it like a person, all the different excuses that you hear for not giving a horse treats. Um, as long as the horse is not aggressive about the food, um, you can use food during the training usually without a problem. And the purpose behind doing it is that when a horse is chewing and eating, it's using a different part of its brain than it uses to flee and react. And there are several different trainers that speak on this topic. Uh, one that comes immediately to mind is Linda Tellington Jones. So if you want to uh, get further information on that, you can probably look to her for uh, some information on that topic. So if you um, give food in whatever method you're using, whether it be food reward training or uh, at set intervals or when the horse is starting to get antsy or if you're using clicker training, um, those help to teach a horse to stay in that frame of mind. Uh, if you notice, my horse, when I do training with him, is very calm. And that's because I use food reward training a lot. I use clicker training, food reward training. I use all the different ones depending on what I'm doing. And it helps to keep him in that frame of mind rather than the react and, and move away. So you might want to consider uh, food training. My horse knows several different cues for head down. Uh, you can put your hand on his head and put his head down. You can put his hand on his neck and put his head down. You can tap his neck and put his head down. You can tell him put your head down. Um, you can put a lunge whip on his back and he'll put his head down. That one I did because when I cue him to move out, if I lunge him, which I very seldom ever do that, if I do, it's not to uh, wear the tar out of him. It's to teach him something. But um, if I put the lunge whip on his back and he puts his head down and then I cue him to move out, he's moving out with his head down rather than moving out with his head up. And I have a very short clip on that that I think I can throw in there real quick. But anyway, he knows several different cues for putting his head down. And I taught him this cue that I'm going to show you specifically to use when I'm introducing scary objects. And what I do is I release my breath and I sink my body down. I go, and he puts his head down as I release my breath and sink my body. And that does a couple different things. It gets him to put his head down, which can help him to release some tension if he's not too excited. And the other thing is it can release tension in me or it can be perceived that it's releasing tension in me to the horse. And a horse mirrors people and what they're thinking, doing, and feeling. So if it perceives that you're releasing your tension, it'll help the horse relieve its tension. Now if a horse is uh, very antsy, if you see them real rigid and so forth like this, um, you probably want to move their feet because if you do something with the horse that spooks the horse and they're standing all scared like this and then you try to do it to them again they're still going to retain that same tension and you do not want to teach them to internalize that tension you want to have them let it go so if you move their feet and just give them a little run around you can even just let them freely run around themselves or you can direct them I, I would encourage you to try to do some free movement uh, with the horse to teach the horse how to release its own tension but either way I would suggest that you move their feet and then try it again because horses when they're tense hold a lot of tension in their legs especially you'll see a lot of times horses will be leaning and that's the direction they're thinking of taking off um, the tension is held in their legs because they're a flight animal so if you can get them to move it'll release that tension and then you can try and introduce a scary object and start anew without all that tension still being in there. Very good. Very good. Very nice job, O. Very nice job. <clears throat> Thank you.
if he's tense when I do something with a noodle and he stands still, he's not going to release that tension. If I try it again, he's just still going to retain that same tension. So if he looks like he's tense when I do it and he doesn't move his feet, then if I do something that calms him in between, it'll be very helpful. And one of the things we do is if I release my breath, he puts his head down. My horse has a, um, I don't know exactly what I'd call it, I've never seen anybody else um, teach their horse to do this, but he has a, um, I guess you'd call it a default head down behavior. Um, when my horse can't think of what else to do, he'll either try to put his head down or he'll back up. And um, usually in a situation with a, a scary object, something that's overwhelming to him, he'll choose to put his head down because he's been taught that I'll remove the scary if he puts his head down. And this is kind of tough to tell you how to do this in a couple minutes because it's taken me years to get him to realize what it is. Um, I've had a situation where I was on him one day and uh, it was around sunset and the sun was shining really bright on my red car and he saw our shadow go across that car and interrupt that sun shining on it and it spooked him and he was like this and I didn't dare get off of him because that's a volatile situation right there and it, he knew he was supposed to stand still because we've done spook in place over and over and over again for nine years it, we play it as a game that uh, if he moves his feet I go ha ha you moved your feet and he gets that look like darn no snack so he knows that he's done it so many times that he's supposed to stand still and what he did was he eventually he put his head down he did it real quick like oh yeah and he put his head down and I knew then I could get off because he was telling me to get off he was saying remove the scary um, the, tr I'll try to say real quickly how I worked with him on this um, I taught him as I said that if he puts his head down I remove the scary and the way that you work towards not having him get away with just putting his head down all the time is say you're putting something over his head and you you got an idea he's going to start to put his head down you change and go to doing a different movement with the item before he thinks to put his head down now you have to balance this so that sometimes you're rewarding him for putting his head down by removing the scary by letting him get to the point where he thinks of putting his head down and you remove the scary um, and then other times you have to switch before he thinks to put his head down to some other movement so that he's not always having both um, if you if you want to teach your horse that and this isn't clear enough email me and, and I'll help you out with it because it's a very convenient thing to have uh, your horse do The other thing that I do when I'm introducing scary objects as an exercise with my horse is I do it without the horse having on any tack. I don't put a halter and lead rope on them because I don't want to be tempted in any way to restrain him. I want him to learn how to handle and process himself and I don't want to be forcing him in any way to participate. Um, one thing that you need to know if you do this with a horse is that if the horse gets so overwhelmed that it leaves you, um, all you need to do is leave also. You don't need to chase the horse or force it to do round penning because it left you or anything like that. You don't want to do that. All you need to do is also leave. If the horse chooses to leave and you leave, you're still on equal ground. If the horse chooses to leave and you stay standing there, then that horse has uh, put himself uh, a notch up higher than you as leader. 
because he chose the thing was scary and decided he was going to take off and leave you. You don't want that. So if he chooses to leave, then you also leave. And then you give him a couple seconds to process and he might come back on his own or you might have to go and round him up and bring him back again. When I say that I teach my horse everything first without tack, I mean that quite literally. I taught my horse to lead beside me without tack. I got him when he was four months old and uh, it took me uh, quite a little while to get him to accept putting the halter on and off because I didn't force him to do it. I did it gradually each day until he was willing to have it taken on and off. And during that process where I was working on him with the uh, halter, I uh, taught him to lead beside me. And so we did that without any halter or lead rope on. Uh, he learned where he was supposed to walk beside me. Um, I taught him to have his feet handled and his feet trimmed without having a halter or lead rope on. This horse actually has never been haltered uh, or held in any way to have his feet trimmed. He has always stood on his own to have his feet trimmed. Uh, same with uh, taking his temperature. He stands on his own to have that done. He has never been haltered or held in any way to have that done. It might be worth noting here the first interaction that I had with this horse. He is a PMU foal out of Manitoba, Canada. I got him when he was four months old, so he wasn't handled by humans other than what it took to cross him over the border and then pick him up and bring him down here. Um, he was kind of like a little wild thing. and. Uh, the very first thing that I did with him, I brought him home, it was raining and it was dark out and I let him loose in the paddock and let him find his own way around, showed him where the uh, stall was and so forth. And then the next morning when I went out, I took this ball that I had bought for him. It's a, it's a zoo ball, it has pebbles in it, real thick wall on it, so it, it's made for bears and cougars to play with and uh, it makes a noise because of the pebbles in it. And uh, I went down and he was very skittish of me, he was hanging back and so forth and um, my friends were telling me, oh put a halter on him, and I was like, no, 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 I, I want him to get to know me. So I took that ball and I pretended to play with it. I pushed it around with my feet and I made laughing noises and made like real smiles and like, oh I'm having a really good time and he like perked up and he watched me and I rolled the ball over to him and I walked away. and each time I would come down, I'd wait a little while and I'd come back down a little, in a little bit and I'd do the same thing. I'd roll a ball over to him. Well, very quickly, I went to walk away after, I don't know, it was like third or fourth time I did that. I went to walk away from him. I heard the pebbles in the ball move. And I turned around and I looked back. And, and then I continued to walk. I heard the pebbles again and I turned around and I looked back and each time I walked away he moved the ball and I looked back so we gradually ended up playing ball together because whenever he would move the ball I would walk back to him and that's how I introduced myself to that horse I didn't try to reach out and touch him, reach out and pet him or anything like that I picked something that was totally neutral and I put it out there for him hey this is a ball we play with it you wanna play with me 
It was an invitation and he accepted the invitation. Horses aren't given enough credit. Horses are very capable of learning, thinking, and also of applying what they've learned to new situations. So often I hear people say, well, what you teach the horse on the right side, you got to teach it on the left side. And if you teach it in one situation, you have to reteach it in another situation. That's because of the method that they're using to teach the horse. They're not actually teaching the horse. I have a good example of my horse learning to apply something that learned in one situation in another situation. When I got my horse, as I said, he was four months old. He was a PMU foal out of Manitoba, Canada. And uh, he was cute and cuddly and little. And when I'd go out to him, he looked so so lost, you know, and little without his mom and everything, that um, I'd give him a little kiss before I'd leave. And it got to be that after a while, he learned that every time I came out to give him hay, I was going to give him a kiss and he was going to leave. So if I hung around and I pet him, he would give me a kiss. And he'd be saying, all right, you can go now, basically. And you'll see him do this in a situation like where he's in the shot visit with the vet and he's becoming overwhelmed and he wants it to stop he will actually give me kisses repeatedly and what he's doing in that situation is he's saying you can go away now <laughs> and he took that concept that she'll leave when I give her a kiss at the hay bin and applied that to the situation with the vet that well at the hay bin if I give her a kiss she chuckles and then she leaves so if I give her a kiss repeatedly at the vet visit maybe she'll do the same this is a very good example of a horse learning to apply something that it learned really really seriously try to consider that a horse is capable of doing this Nice work. Nice. Good job. Come back. Let's go through this one. There you go. Come back this way.